In this video, we're going to cover a type of next generation sequencing called ion torrent. In the process of DNA synthesis, incorporating a new nucleotide involves forming a new covalent bond here, causing the release of these two phosphate molecules, called a pyrophosphate, and a positively charged hydrogen ion. Ion torrent sequencing exploits this by sequencing DNA through the detection of these hydrogen ions, which are released during DNA polymerization. In ion torrent sequencing, lots of hydrogen ions in a well will cause the pH to change and will change the conductivity detected by a semiconductor chip which we loaded our DNA onto. We can then process these signals to determine the DNA sequence. And it does this in four steps, library preparation, emulsion PCR, loading onto ion chip, and signal processing. So first, we need to prepare the DNA for sequencing. We need to fragment it, which we can do by sonication or nebulization. Then we add specific adapters to both ends of the DNA, both the 5' prime and the 3' prime ends. Then we need to amplify the DNA through emulsion PCR, which is a variation of PCR that some next generation technologies use to replicate DNA sequences. To perform emulsion PCR, we incubate the DNA with a microscopic bead which is bound all around with complementary oligos to our adapters that we stuck onto the ends of the template DNA earlier. This allows each single-stranded DNA to stick to the DNA capture bead, and we dilute the mixture to ensure that each bead only has one template strand attached. Then we add oil. After all, this is an emulsion, which means that we have two liquids that aren't miscible, and this creates microvesicles so small that they can only hold one bead per vesicle, like you see here. Then, inside these drops is not only one bead bound to one template DNA, but the components you need in a typical PCR reaction, like polymerase, DNTPs, primer, and buffer. So if you think about it, these microvesicles act like a microreactor for PCR to occur, and amplify the DNA strands so that we have thousands of copies. All of these microvesicles floating around the mixture are simultaneously amplifying DNA, so we end up with millions and millions of copies. PCR makes a complementary strand of the DNA. So in each microvesicle, we have a bead and one fragment anneals to its complementary adapter site on the bead. The polymerase which was added to the PCR mix amplifies the strand from the bead so that it creates another copy. Then the original strand denatures, but the strand which was just created is connected to the bead by the sugar phosphate backbone, so it's forced to stick around. The strand which dissociates will float away and anneal onto another oligo on the same bead, and the cycle repeats itself 30 to 60 more times, until we end up with several thousands of the same DNA sequence conjugated to the same bead. And this happens on every bead. PCR is important because if we only had one strand of DNA releasing one hydrogen ion at a time when a nucleotide is incorporated, our chip won't be able to detect it. It just isn't sensitive enough. It will, however, be able to detect thousands of hydrogen ions being released at the same time from all of these copies. Then we break the emulsion and load the beads onto a chip. Each ion chip contains millions of microwells which will each hold a single bead. Later, we'll flood the microwells with nucleotides, one type at a time. And this is what a single well looks like. This chip has a semiconductor membrane that will detect when a nucleotide is incorporated because it'll detect the hydrogen ion. Beneath the microwell is an ion-sensitive layer, and below it is an ISFET sensor plate. ISFET stands for Ion Sensitive Field Effect Transistor, which is a transistor used for measuring ion concentrations in solution. So in our case, when the hydrogen ion concentration changes in a well, it will result in a change in the current through the transistor. Again, a single microwell contains the template DNA strand we want to sequence, along with polymerase and primers. We flood the microwells with one of four nucleotides at a time. Up here is a zoomed in diagram of a polymerase elongating a single DNA template, and it's currently stalled till we add the right nucleotide that complements the template we're trying to figure out. If the nucleotide we added does not complement the next base on the template, there will be no release of hydrogen and therefore no polymerization reaction. For example, if we flood the well with guanine, no voltage is detected, which means that the base wasn't incorporated. So we'll need to wash out the unattached nucleotides before the next cycle of nucleotides are added to avoid confusing which base is actually being added. In this example, adding adenine and cytosine also didn't change the voltage, so we have to wash it away. If the nucleotide does complement the next base on the template, 
it'll be incorporated to the growing complementary strand, and a hydrogen ion will be released. This will change the pH of the solution, which triggers the ISFET ion sensor to send a series of electrical pulses to the computer that will be used later on to translate into a DNA sequence. But if the nucleotide complements several bases in a row, more hydrogen will be released and thus a higher voltage will be recorded. In the case of two of the same base in a row, the voltage will be double the normal. For example, if there are two guanine bases in a row, two cytosines will be incorporated, which means twice the amount of hydrogens will be released and a higher voltage. The signal processing and assembling the DNA sequence is carried out by a software. Because we're using electronics to determine whether a reaction occurs, we don't actually need to use any specific kind of nucleotide, like the fluorescently labeled nucleotides used in smart sequencing, or any fancy optics, making ion-torrent sequencing fast, efficient, and adaptable compared to other sequencers.